When the Citizens Theatre revived the Slab Boys in early spring 2015, one of the treats for the audience was the opportunity to overhear a conversation between the writer John Byrne and the director David Heyman. Some of you might in fact have been at that who had first collaborated in the Traverse Theatre production of the play in May 1978. And I say over here as, although it was a question and answer session, it was very much a conversation between friends who had been given the rare opportunity to relive an aspect of their past lives which they had greatly enjoyed. The atmosphere in the audience on that evening was a mixture of warm nostalgia and excited anticipation and many of the participants were eager to attest their presence at the first production and that they'd waited too long for this revival. That this Citizens production was 36 years on from the original and that the setting had now become a much more distant 1957 was really irrelevant, as it is when the play is studied in the classroom. If you have a class with some good readers, the play will work brilliantly as long as you're prepared to have certain scenes collapse as the readers become helpless with laughter. But if not, there's at least one version of the play on DVD, and this is it. The BBC version from 1979, and thus very close to the original stage version, which was originally performed, and it's claimed by the BBC, rather strangely, as written for the play for today, Strand, um, stars Gerard Kelly as Sparky. Spanky, rather. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip there. And, and it's available on, you can get it online, but it, it's one of these ones on Amazon that costs you an arm and a leg for some reason. The Film 4 version appears on the Film 4 website, but doesn't appear to be available to view. I have never seen this film. I didn't know it had been made um, until I started doing the, the, the research for this. Um, but it, it's rather unfortunate if it isn't available because it looks as if it might have been a, a good version. John Byrne himself has said that the play is pretty autobiographical as he left school as early as he could to get a job and ended up in Stoddard's carpet factory as a slab boy. Like Phil McCann, he had aspirations to be an artist, but unlike Phil's, his dream was successful. Twenty years on, he wanted to write something, possibly a short story, about the carpet factory and the characters who worked there, but he quickly discovered that prose was not the medium. The first version of the play was a musical, 28 pages long, with songs by the late Jerry Rafferty. The text went through 18 drafts in three years, the dialogue changing all the time, although the characters were established from the outset, and it ended up as the text we have now. Byrne was always fascinated with words. He was brought up with a wireless and listened to and read plays, but never anything in Scots, although that was not questioned at the time, as plays just were in English at that time. It is his excellent ear for the vernacular he hears around him, which gives his writing such veracity and vitality. Oh, how do I put this on? Is it just a... You just press the, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, that one. No, that's not that. You just which? press that one. Ah, right. In the revived, uh, sorry. <laughs> In the revived version, Playwright and director were determined not to stage a period piece, despite the very precise setting. This is not a play which is set in stone, as its themes and devices are universal. Perhaps modern readers and audiences will not fully understand the musical and literary references, but they can still appreciate the humour and slapstick, of which there is a good deal, does not rely on words anyway. Only four words were changed in the text, and they relate to smoking on stage, which is now not allowed. And the actors had to be told how correctly to pronounce cooperative, as that has changed since the 1950s as well. The play is a comedy, but one which does not fit easily into many of the conventional dramatic frameworks. It is very episodic for a start, and comprises elements of farce, burlesque, pantomime, sketch comedy, slapstick, stand-up, impressions, caricatures, alongside satire and realism. This is a comedy about real life, a comedy which takes the absurdity of reality to its logical conclusion. Common comic themes include the ridiculing of foolishness, narrow-mindedness and the rigid insistence on inflexible systems, and comic transfigurations permitting the investigation of alternative identities. Even the matter-of-fact ability of language to more or less describe the world is brought into question by comic contortions and linguistic non-sequiturs that create parallel or nonsensical forms of meaning. 
Conventionally and classically, as the playwright William Congreve stated in 1698, was to delight as well as to instruct. And as vicious people are made ashamed of their follies and faults by seeing them exposed in a, in a ridiculous manner, so are good people at once warned and diverted at their expense. In our times, however, comedy is recognised as a social activity first and foremost, conceived with some kind of audience in mind, <coughs> and everywhere produced from the matter of dominant cultural assumptions and commonplaces. Even though comedy often seems to be suspending, inverting or abandoning dominant norms, these inversions are produced in relation to the cultural orthodoxies from which they must always begin. The fish-out-of-water comedies like Molière's Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, Buster Keaton's The General, Eddie Murphy's Trading Places, or Sasha ba Baron Cohen's Ali G character show the disparity between place and self that is continually used in comedy, in which characters are geographically, linguistically, socially, or in some profoundly existential way misplaced. Another stock situation presents a discrepancy between the way a character presents himself and the substance of his actions, as is the case with Shakespeare's pompous Falstaff, or the hypocritical devout in Molière's Tartuffe, or David Brent in The Office. A recurring technique of the Monty Python team was a discussion of quotidian topics in an elevated register, exploiting <coughs> discontinuity between form and content, as in the sports report, blending philosophy with football. Last night in Jaro, we witnessed the resuscitation of a great footballing tradition when Jaro United came of age with an almost Proustian display of modern existentialist football. Virtually annihilating by midfield moral argument the now surely obsolescent Catanacchio defensive philosophy of Signor Alberto Fanfrino. Bologna indeed were a side intellectually out-argued by a Jaro team thrusting and bursting with aggressive Kantian positivism. And one's reminded also of that, that wonderful sketch of the, um, the actors uh, behaving as minors and, and talking about the hardships of the acting life. I mean, there's so much of it. The subversion of appropriate language is shown here as the stuff of comedy. If human beings perceive the world as a language-determined experience where everything is perceived through a linguistic framework, it is the role of language to define the actor's relationship to the world, however inauthentic that relationship may be in actuality. Joking, as is seen in many, many comedic texts, and particularly this one, reveals an underside to socially constructed reason. For Sigmund Freud, jo a joke is an example of parapraxis, an act like a mistake <coughs> or slip of the tongue that exposes something of the repressed thoughts hidden in the unconscious. Like dreams, jokes contain significant information about unconscious thoughts and the nature of inhibition, where the production of a joke is a means of negotiating the psychological barrier between the conscious and the unconscious mind. Freud points out that jokes have a tendency to spring from nowhere, suddenly appearing like little emissaries of the unconscious. A joke has quite outstandingly the characteristic of being a notion that has occurred to us involuntarily. What happens is not that we know a moment be beforehand what joke we are going to make and that all it needs is to be clothed in words. We have an indefinable feeling, rather, which I can best compare with an absence, a sudden release of intellectual tension. And then, all at once, the joke is there, as a rule, already clothed in words. In Freud's analysis, joking is symptomatic of the division of the psyche that characterises human beings. The comic acts as a parallel conversation, tracking reason and subverting it. And you see multiple examples of this in The Slab Boys. Comedy also derives from the human being's reflective attitude towards his experiences, reflecting on the discontinuity between the world in our head and the world outside. The inner self finds itself shut off from physical existence, which goes some way to explain the cruelty of comedy, which requires a certain degree of desensitisation. If it is generically appropriate for tragedy to ask us to be sensible of human suffering, then comedy allows us to stand back and look upon human misfortune, such as the slip on the banana skin, from an emotional distance, sometimes even deriving great pleasure from it. The philosophy of comedy, while enlightening to the scholar, however, is perhaps somewhat deadening to the student. 
I well remember one particular student asking why we had to endlessly deconstruct poems rather than simply reading them for enjoyment. And this might well have been after I'd spent a double period on the first line of Philip Larkin's ambulances. And I actually <laughs> did. And I could do it today. When asked about the main themes and issues of the play, Byrne replied, I've never deconstructed it. That's your teacher's job. I've no idea. I just know it's right. I'm the labourer to my unconscious. The play ultimately is about the aspirations and dreams of young people, their fragility, relative lack of realism, essentiality. Without dreams and without humour, the three could never get through the grinding boredom of the slab room. However, it is an interesting exercise, the philosophy of comedy, when developing further study of the play, perhaps for a student who might want to examine the trilogy for advanced hire to see to what extent Byrne's unconscious writing does in fact respond to and build on classical and classic comic traditions and conventions. So, how do you start teaching the text? Assuming that you can get the clearance to do so from the school's IT guru, there are, as ever, some valuable resources online, namely on YouTube. And from the Citizens Theatre's own web, web, um, website, which I would definitely advise you to go to because it has a massive archive of photographs which are worth <coughs> looking at. Now, um, it would be a good idea to watch the clip, this is the first one here, which I'm not going to play at the moment, of uh, John Byrne and David Heyman talking about the 2015 production, as that situates the play in time and space. Byrne is depicted drawing the characters in his inimical style, and of course this is an example of John Byrne's drawing. Um, and then we move to David Heyman talking about the original and revived productions. Brief character sketches are given and some discussion of the continuing, continuing relevance of the play, which should whet the appetite. The trailer for the Citizens production is taken from the Slab Boy's explanation to the university-educated Alan Downey, who vies with Hector to be the butt of the jokes. The Film 4 trailer, by contrast, concentrates on the music of the period to situ situate some key moments. And we might, if this works, be able actually to see this. <coughs> so this is, in this, this is the citizens. This is a slab room. Where all the colours are ground and dished for the designers. Right then. Let's show you some of the mysteries in the slab room. Mr. Farrell. Mr. Mack. I'm just showing the people here some of the intricacies of our work. If you and the boy would care to storm to the land side. Certainly. Hector! Many thanks. Right. This here is what we cry a sink. S-I-N-K. Now, I don't expect you to pick up all these terms immediately, but you'll soon get the hang of it. And this is what we call a slab boy. You see it, slab boy. <laughs> Note the keen eye, the firm set of the jaw. They're both up under cucumber plates. Note too, the arse hanging out the trousers. This last because the slab boy for all he is a special breed. Trained to a hair is expected to put in a full eight hours sweated labour a fortnight for a few measly shillings. And all the gum crystals he can eat, hence the form set the jaw. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Don't mention it. Don't you wish she was one of this happy band? Aye. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> and briefly, the Film 4 version, which is coming up as a blank page. Right, don't know quite what's happening there. Never mind. Anyway, um, oh, sorry, back again. Anyway, these uh, these resources are all there, and if you if you simply um, Google Slab Boys, um, other search engines are available, of course. Um, you will find all of these. Longer and more detailed interviews with both Byrne and Heyman, uh, these are the, the last two on the list there, give uh, fascinating insights into the play, but could perhaps be set as homework as they're quite long. They're about 20 minutes each, but definitely well worth um, having a look at. Um, ASLS will be producing a teaching note on the play, which will be available for downloading from the website. It's just about ready to go. 
This will give suggestions on how to approach the play in the classroom. And although it's generalised and not detailed, you can be sure that it was the basis of a term's worth of lessons with a very mixed S56 Intermediate 2 class, as it was then designated, and it went down well. The structure of the play is quite simple. It covers a working Friday with Act 1 mid-morning to lunchtime and Act 2 the afternoon to finishing time. In Act 1, we are introduced to all the characters who interact in a number of scenes. The boss, Willie Curry, berates the three slab boys, Phil, Spanky and Hector, for their laziness. Designer Jack Hogg introduces Alan Downey as a temporary worker. We hear about Phil's mother's latest escapade. Sadie, the tea lady, arrives with her trolley and sells Hector a double ticket for the staff dance. We meet Lucille, the slab boy's dream. Phil and Spanky design to help redesign Hector, so Lucille will go to the dance with him. Alan finds Phil's art call portfolio and inadvertently lets Curry see it. There's a first real row between Phil and Spanky and the lunch hooter goes. Act two opens after the lunch break with Phil and Spanky reacting histrionically and clearly greatly exaggeratedly to the horrors of the canteen. Much of the same happens in this act in terms of the Phil and Spanky double act, Willie Curry's complaints and threats, and the slab boy's abuse of Jack Hogg and Alan Downey. But this time there's more bite. The language is stronger, there's considerably more swearing, and the set pieces have a much harder edge. Phil's and Hector's pay packets are missing. Hector's restyling results in real damage both to him and his clothes. Lucille is terrified by the sight of Hector looming at her through the window and then out of a cupboard. And, takes, and Sadie takes out her frustrations and bad feet on Phil, giving him a hard slap on the head for his cheek. There's a message to say that Phil's mum has escaped from the hospital and is on the run. Perhaps inevitably Phil does not get into art college and he's actually sacked from the carpet factory. The only really bright note is that Hector is promoted to a designer's desk, while Spanky is told that if he knuckles down, he might get a similar promotion in about 18 months. Alan ends up going to the staff dance with Lucille, where they will all meet in the next play of the trilogy, Cutting a Rug. So let's start by looking at the characters, and these are um, from John Byrne's own descriptions of them. <coughs> and I keep moving this on. <coughs> Uh, the three slab boys are the lowest of the low, although officially apprentice designers, but all have dreams of getting out of the slab room. Phil and Spanky are clearly kindred spirits whose relationship enables them to get through the drudgery of the work. Hector is their fall guy, the butt of their jokes, but they do genuinely at times want to bring him out of his shell as they recognise that he knows far less about life than they do. Alan is a new audience, someone who's not heard the routines before, as uh, Phil Hector, Phil and Spanky um, from the, the film version. Um, Alan is a new audience, someone who's not heard the routines before and can be another target. Never using his own name, but always an alternative beginning with A is a rather childish means of denying him an identity, as they also do with Mr Curry, calling him Curly, Corey, Cardew. Jack Hogg was made particularly horrible in this production. And you can see him on the left with his pustular face. Um, incidentally, Phil McCann, according to John Byrne himself, was named for the slogan of a Glasgow University rag week. You know, fill my collecting can. And Spanky sounds like a school nickname which is stuck, although you may well have noticed that in the, in the trailer, um, the actor playing Spanky had a black eye. So maybe Spanky is to do with the fact that he's a bit of a, a fighter, scrapper, um, after hours. Hector is comically misnamed after the Trojan hero, as he is described as small and weedy. The characters are not in any way stereotypes, however, as their behaviour cannot be accurately predicted. And this is where we go back to the sort of philosophy of comedy again. They have something in, com in common with the Commedia dell'arte Zani, who are the clown characters responsible for the comedy, giving us the word zany, which often brings them into conflict with the two vecchi or irascible old men who are always concerned to present, prevent the Tsani doing whatever they are aiming at, usually involving a beautiful young woman. Already the parallels are clear. The Tsani are Phil and Spanky, the vecchi are Mr Curry, obviously, and stretching a point a bit, Jack Hogg, and Lucille is the goal. Restoration comedy introduced the character of the wit, who showed a quick inventiveness in language that takes advantage of the play of associations generated by any utterance. He asserts his social superiority and individually ab individuality above the ordinary dullness of society. Wit, 
Wit is the verbal manifestation of agile virility that triumphs over the neutered fops, gaining wealth, respect and women as returns. Both Phil and Spanky have this kind of quick-wittedness honed over the months of their time together in the slab room, but because this is a creative depiction of real life rather than a play, they do not get the rewards that their 17th century equivalents would expect. There is e even an occasional reminder in Willie Curry predominantly of Tony Hancock's comic character, the man who is always disappointed in the behaviour of others and who shows up his own inadequacies in the inappropriatenesses of his comparisons. Other aspects of classical comedy with which Byrne plays are the notion of the grotesque, principally involving Jack Hogg, whose unfortunate skin complaint is grotesquely exaggerated for comic effect. The running diarrhoea joke is another aspect of grotesquerie, which enables the audience to picture with some degree of enjoyable distaste the hilarious verbal trickery. Hector is in many ways a typical slapstick character, like Charlie Chaplin's Little Tramp. In Slapstick, the comedian plays the role of the outsider, a marginal man swimming against the tide, an innocent in a world he has not mastered. He's continually prone to physical attack in an almost cartoon form, and of course actually in cartoons, think Tom and Jerry, Roadrunner and um, the Coy Wiley Coyote and so on. But keeps coming back for more as he cannot be really injured. However, once again, as this is creative, real life, Hector is hurt and he really does suffer from the indignities heaped on him. In this play, he's also a travesty character, dressed up inappropriately and ridiculously in the belief that he's in the height of fashion. Finally, the use of ridicule to subvert the master-servant and here boss-employee role is seen throughout. Phil and Spanky's attitude to Jack Hogg, their erstwhile slab room companion and now self-satisfied designer, and to Willie Curry, their boss, and indeed Phil's attitude to the owner of the company, the never-seen Sir Wallace Barton, is profoundly disrespectful, ridiculing and demeaning. Although only Jack Hogg is ridiculed to his face until the end of the play. The audience is fully complicit in this, as we are sympathetic to the slab boys from the outset and tend to take their side in the action and the conflict. The scene is set at the opening of the play with Phil McCann being somewhat set up by Spanky Farrell who's told their boss, Curry, that Phil is stuck in the toilets with diarrhoea because he's late coming in. Byrne here introducing a kind of running excremental gag which will surface intermittently throughout the play. Phil has difficulty saying the word, never mind spelling it. When Curry asks him, ha, there you are McCann, where have you been this morning? Farrell said you were unwell. And Phil replies, um, uh, touch of the uh, uh, draw, uh, dio, raw, the skidders, it was very bad. <laughs> In the first couple of pages, we are introduced to the relationship between Phil and Spanky and relative disregard for Hector, their antipathy and total lack of respect for Curry and his continual blustering threats. <coughs> Phil and Spanky effortlessly morph into a Billy Bunter riff, which is strangely appropriate to the entry of Jack Hogg and Alan Downey and I'm not reading through these, I'll let, I'll let you read these ones for yourself. Then with a, in a few lines are characters in a horror film, this is painting the, the sign on the door, demonstrators in a TV programme, as you've already seen in the trailer, and a slick-talking double act, which is what they actually do for most of the time. Jack Hogg used to be a slab boy, but since moving to a designer's desk, he disdains his former companions, while Alan Downey is on work experience in the university vacation and is clearly from a different class. However, the clowning of Phil and Spanky reveals a sharpness of intellect that is typical of the Glasgow gallusness that Byrne is celebrating in the play. However, there are darker moments. After the clowning and the departure of Alan and Jack for a recce around the rug works, Phil suddenly asks, do you think going off your head's catching? His mother is mentally unstable and frequently mentally ill enough to be committed to an institution, which has just happened again. Phil's deadpan, she wasn't all that bad either, not for her that is. All she'd done was run up the street with her hair on fire and dive through the cooperative windows. It's one of these instances which aud audience members frequently feel uncomfortable about, as it is funny, but they don't feel they should be laughing. The same is true of Spanky's response to Phil's statement that she'll spend the first week tied to a rubber mattress, the next, fi the next five wired up to a generator, when he says, that's shocking. <laughs> 
Phil's description of his mother's regime in the mental hospital reveals the, to us, worst kind of unenlightened treatment of a mental condition. But it's not until much later in the play that he reveals the reality of his home life and his mother's suicide attempt. The description of the convalescent home in West Kilbride, although amusing, is incredibly saddening at the same time. Until he tells the story of the, the doll about 19 or 20, he was 11 at the time, who appears at the door, takes a couple of hops into the room, then turns this cartwheel right down the middle of the two rows of deck chairs, lands on our pins. da -da! Brilliant. I started to laugh and got a scalp on the nut. Matron was beeling. Why she had done this was a mystery. Maybe she woke up that morning and seen her face in the wax cloak, remembered something. Christ, I'm alive. Everybody hated her after that. We shall be reminded of this scene at Phil's final exit. The insertion of serious material into comedy is not unusual, of course, as it helps to heighten the comic effects by contrast. Much as Shakespeare puts comic scenes into all his tragedies to relieve the tension and to heighten the horror. Phil can't help creating a semi-comic description of the awful situation, which ends with the account of his mother's being signed in for treatment as a voluntary patient after she'd been given a jag to knock her out. Mr Curry's interventions are also a mixture of the serious and the comic. Serious as he is warning the slab boys that their jobs are on the line if they don't improve, but comic in the inappropriate comparisons and continually harping on his wartime experiences. Phil and Spanky respond in their own way to everything Curry says to ridicule and demean him, confident that his threats are mere bluster, never to be fulfilled. He also walks into their ridicule by some of his responses to them, such as when he asks Phil again why he was late and is told, um, Christ, um, severe diarrhoea of the bot, and he replies, if you think I'm swallowing that, you're very much mistaken, friend. <laughs> the dream of all is to get a designer's desk although it appears that this is likely to remain a dream. However, Byrne uses irony effectively, which of course works as the way irony does until you've read through the play and find out, find out what actually happens. You don't realise how ironic it is. Hector says, they're always going on about getting out of the slab room and onto a desk. Some hope. Jack Hogg was four years in here before he even got a sniff of a desk. And Spanky replies, there was a lot more designers in Jack's day. There's hundreds of desks out there. I'm asking Willie Curry for one. Hector, you might as well resign yourself. You're in the slab room till Miss MacDonald down the canteen gets a rise out of her suet souffle. And after Willie Curry has berated them again for the poor quality of their work, Spanky asks, do you think that might have been a good moment to ask him for a desk, Phil? And Phil replies, yeah, you might have been lucky and got your jotters. In what is an easily overlooked speech, Curry tells them, I'm putting in a report to Mr Barton and you, McCann, are top of my list. And you can wipe that smile off your face, Farrell, you're on the report too. Although there is solidarity among the slab boys against the management, they're still individuals looking out for themselves. And this is the first instance where we see a breaking in the ranks, when Spanky accuses the other two of doing as little as he to fill the cabinet with drowned colours, apparently precipitating Curry's wrath towards Hector as he is summoned to his office later. Although Hector is often the butt of Phil and Spanky, he does have a, sp a supporter in, in Sadie, the tea lady, who always keeps something special for him on the trolley. Sadie is also responsible for the tickets for the staff dance, which introduces another plot thread. Much to the surprise of all, Hector buys a double ticket for the dance. In a spectacular error of judgment, he has decided that he's going to ask Lucille Bentley, every slab boy's dream, to go to the dance with him. For once, Phil and Spanky are absolutely correct that she would never contemplate going with him, but they think that she has already agreed. Just at this moment, Lucille enters, singing appropriately, Once I Had a Secret Love. Significantly, she asked, What one of you greedy gannets has been at Miss Walkinshaw's lunch pail? Her sandwiches are covered in yellow ochre and her orange is glued to her tomato. You know she's got a caliper, as if that's <laughs> relevant. Miss Walkinshaw is as far on the female spectrum from Lucille as it is possible to be, farther even than Sadie and Miss MacDonald in the canteen, both of whom have something of edible value to offer to the men in the place. When Lucille discovers that it is believed she is going to the staff dance with Hector, she explodes. What a bloody insult! I've seen better hanging from a Christmas tree! Hector, don't make me laugh! Before immediately asking Alan to come and visit her in the sketching department. This is the beginning of yet another running plot thread, the remodelling of Hector to make him attractive enough for Lucille to accept his offer, which will give rise to some serious damage to his person and his wardrobe. 
In classic slapstick form, he's thrown over Phil's shoulder and taken down to the lavatories to have his hair cut with a pair of carpet shears. Rather surprisingly, once Spanky is left alone in the slab room, he starts work on grinding the required colours. Not only does he repeat accurately the long list of colours Jack had reeled off, but he's clearly trusted by Jack to show Alan the process of producing the colours for the designers. Despite his throwaway attitude, he is a capable worker who can teach Alan the correct method. Characteristically, Spanky denies that there is any expertise required. OK, OK, you get the stuff, pop it on the slab, water, bum, uh, water gum, bingo, you grind away until you feel like a smoke. He does know what he's about, adjusting Alan's grip on the knife to make it easier for him to work it. But it's not going to make everything easy for him, letting him dish the paint without gum in it, and then not telling him that he could have added the gum once it was dished anyway. It's only now, when Phil is absent, that we hear that he, Phil, too, stayed on at school to take hires. But unlike Alan, he didn't actually sit the exams, being expelled for smacking the French teacher in the mouth with a German biscuit, which is obviously the way Phil described it. Alan is the cause of yet another row involving Phil when he discovers his portfolio and looks through it, the, the work in it. He is genuinely complimentary, but unfortunately Curry arrives just in time to see the drawings and casts a decisive eye over them. They aren't yours, Farrell, that's for sure. You've got trouble trying to, trying to draw water from that tap over there, and they can't be Hector's too bold for him. This is a far more serious matter than anything that has gone before, as Phil, as an indentured apprentice, is not entitled to leave the job before his time is out or he is sacked. Phil must have been aware of the terms of his indentures, but characteristically has decided to ignore them in favour of what he wants to do in life. He's incensed at Curry's accusations and only angered further when Jack, trying to be conciliatory, tells Phil that he sat the art college exam earlier but didn't get in. Not only has he entered the exam without permission, he has persuaded a doll in the art college office to ring up and tell him the outcome in the afternoon rather than waiting for the usual letter. Phil uses his personal attractiveness to persuade girls to do what he wants, as we shall see on a number of future occasions in the play, because he doesn't see why he should wait like everyone else. And when Jack says, that's a bit off, other people have to wait on their letters, Phil says, I'm not other people, Jack. We're reminded of the Hancock character again here, always trying to better himself while all the time believing that he is better than everyone else anyway. The first act ends with Hector again being summoned to Curry's office, but described in absentia as wandering around in his simit while his clothes have been removed for restyling and a cut ear from the carpet shears, all part of Phil's attempt to get him to the dance with Lucille. Even to Spanky, this appears too much, as his grotesque description shows. Yeah, some chance he's got now. Who'd want to go at the staffy with a one-eared, baldy-headed midget, midget and a blood-stained blood simmet? But Phil appears to be serious in his intent for once. Listen, you know how much this means to heck, getting, to go at the, um, getting a date with Lucille. I mean, to you and me, she's just a bit of stuff. But to Hector, she is it, the real thing, the Empire State, Niagara Falls. Act 2 revisits and reiterates much of what we've already seen in Act 1, but the genius of Byrne's writing is that we do not ever feel that we are not seeing something new and original. Once again, Curry catches Phil and Spanky lounging about while Alan is grinding the colour. This time, Curry's comparisons, which tended to relate to the way the slab room was run in his and Jack Hogg's day, take him to his army service in Burma. If you'd seen these POWs breaking their backs on the Burma Road, young chaps, age of yourselves, dropping like flies, berry berry, cholera, you name it, not a peep out of them, scabbing away like Billy or rather than give in. We are perhaps reminded that Hector's uncle Bertie was killed while in the Navy at the age of 19. Spanky has heard that Willie was a typist in the pay corps. Nearest he ever got to Burma was the bamboo tea lounge in Inkle Street which Phil will throw back at him later. But in the following play, we see Byrne's sketch of Curry complete with dress, wear, medal, ribbon, Burma star, etc. We find more about the relationship with Hector too when Jack Hogg says, you nobled Hector when he first started, didn't you? He used to come out to my desk. We'd go through some carpet mags together, but oh no, you super put a stop to that. Called him for everything, made his life a misery. A pair of bully boys, that's what you are. Hector could have been a pretty good designer by now. Yes, he could. It is just as Phil is making an approach to Lucille about going to the dance that Hector appears visually rather than ver verbally as we last heard of him. The stage direction is precise. 
Just then a face appears at the dirty window. It is Hector, half visible through the dirty glass. He has a blood-stained rag knotted round his head. He's in his underwear. Lucille, seeing him, screams and exits, leaving Phil, who's not yet seen him, nonplussed until he turns to the window. The changes of tone come thick and fast. No sooner have we, uh, have we had the grotesque appearance in both senses of Hector than Curry re uh, returns in conciliatory move, mood. About this morning, McCann, I was only going to say that if you're prepared to pull your socks up, toe the line, then I'm prepared to forget the whole episode. Just show you're willing. McCann, that's all I'm asking. These things don't go unnoticed, you know. Mr Barton keeps a weather eye open for lads like yourself, ones that buckle down and get on with it. Right? We're surprised by this, but Curry has clearly taken note of the qualities shown in Phil's portfolio and recognises the benefits that could accrue to the company if he were to work with them rather than against them. Sorry, I missed what... Oh, all oh, right. I had timed this and it was absolutely precise. Uh, must have been that making... Right, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to cut uh, right to the end. There are other other bits which are good bits of dialogue um, but I'm going to the point where Phil finally gets his chance to have a go at Willie Curry. You're forgetting something Curry, this is after he's had his books. I don't work here anymore remember and while we're at it you can drop all that gibbon shit about the jungle. Jimmy Robertson blew the gaff. The only stuff you've ever hacked your way through is a battalion's pay slips. You fighting the Japs. You couldn't punch your way out of an origami toilet bag. And just what did you give me the book for anyhow? It wasn't for the cheek I gave you. We've all done that. And it couldn't be for loafing about either. That's dirty good in this joint. No, what got you by the short and curlies was the thought of me, scruff, going to the art school, wasn't it? That I might just have the savvy to realise there was more to life than giving myself housemaid's knee on them slabs. And Curry replies, shut it, you miserable young upstart. How dare you shut your mouth off like that? Since the day and hour you walked through that door, you've tried to call the legs from under me. Yes, I wish it had been me that gave you your cards, but Mr Barton beat me to the punch. Get that lazy young bastard out of here, Curry, or I'll have those gaffer stripes off you. Yeah, that's knocked you back, McCann. Muggins here even asked for a second chance for you. Me, for you. So you got your art school, and I hope it's a damn sight easier for you there, right? And for your information, Jimmy Robertson's got hammer toes. He couldn't even dig for victory. <laughs> The last word has to go to Phil, back to the bunter routine. I wonder what the governor's got for one's tea tonight. A plate of jolly fine mince, perhaps, or a shoulder of lamb to cry on. Picks up dust coat. Would you mind stuffing that down Quelch's throat as you leave all bean thanks? Oh, and do pop a few of bunter's boils for me, that's a good chap. What a bally day. Started off pleasantly enough, one's mater off for a few days in the country. But fuck me if it ain't gone downhill since then. <laughs> Christ, I've just remembered something. He takes a couple of steps and executes a cartwheel. Giotto used to be a slab boy, Spanks. And we remember and are now seeing the earlier account of the girl who cartwheeled through the convalescence, who had suddenly remembered that she was alive. This has been a canter at high speed through a play that merits much closer and more detailed study. I'm glad to see it on the set, test, set text list for hire, as it will speak to students in their own language. And by that, I don't mean the Paisley demotic, but in terms of the ridicule of authority and the clowning. It stands alongside the Cheevy of the Stag and the Black Black Oil, Men Should Weep and the Steamy in the Modern Scottish Canon, and should be read and performed much more often. Thank you.